when we think about how UKCA is being used, effectively, because UKCA, uh, as you uh, know at the moment, uh, it forms part of the, the Met Office unified model uh, code. It, it sits at the heart of uh, a range of different applications from air quality modeling using the AQUM configuration uh, to earth system modeling using the UK ESM um, configuration. What I think uh, most of the uh, research going on in academic institutes at the moment focuses on is the global composition modeling. Uh, and that really uses UKCA in either a GC configuration or, or a GA configuration, so global atmosphere configuration. But UKCA effectively, um, as you can see uh, here, is being used by a wide number of different stakeholders um, for a wide number of different purposes. In terms of, you know, what are these purposes for using UKCA in, in scientifically? Well, th there is this uh, really important need for, for understanding how air quality is going to change. Uh, and UKCA uh, is the chemistry and aerosol component that forms uh, AQUM. So we might be interested in, in very uh, local. Uh, and when I say local, we probably mean national uh, scale problems. Um, I don't know much about what those of you are, are working on, but, but air quality is certainly a field which has re-emerged as being a, a massive priority um, in terms of government uh, uh, sort of agendas. Um, I'm sure uh, as a result of the, the lockdown, um, people have been thinking a bit more about the, the quality of the air that we're breathing, whether that's outside or, or inside. Um, and so air quality science has really seen um, a huge uh, uh, level of investment and uh, a huge uh, renewal of interest. Um, some of the problems uh, for air quality, though, are not just local, but are more regional. And so uh, UKCA provides uh, a way of addressing the, the scales of uh, this problem of air quality. Um, many, of, uh, many of you might be more interested in specific parts of the UKCA model. Uh, and one area which um, kind of gets a lot of attention is the aerosol side of uh, UKCA, so the A in UKCA. Um, and uh, we might be interested in addressing problems around how aerosols have changed as a result of human or, or natural processes and how those changes in aerosols interact with the, the physical um, climate system. And those main interactions are through, uh, through clouds and radiation. Now, um, you may have started to get an appreciation for just how complex UKCA is uh, and to, to address part of the complexity, but the need for understanding how aerosols are changing. So aerosols themselves or changes in aerosols, I should say, represent one of the greatest uncertainties in the, um, in the climate uh, system. Um, now, to address the problem of complexity, uh, there are different flavours of UKCA to focus on aerosol modelling. Um, I think in these tutorials, you're looking at what I would call the, the full UKCA, so enabling full interactions. But there is a version of UKCA which uh, effectively uses offline oxidants. And so that uh, makes... Uh, um, the, the focus really on understanding the evolution of aerosols and how they might affect clouds and, and atmospheric physics uh, and reads in uh, the, the important chemical fields which, uh, which affect the aerosol precursors and uh, aerosols themselves. Um, another, I guess, overarching challenge which uh, uh, requires UKCA is just understanding global change. So maybe um, 30 or 40 years ago, before I'm sure you know many of you were born, um, the, the major global change question that was uh, being um, discussed was uh, the, the changes in the stratospheric ozone layer. We, we know the, the causes of this, so um, every um, spring in the southern hemisphere we see massive uh, 
reductions in the stratospheric ozone column that is um, associated or has been shown to be associated with increases in skin cancers in Australia and New Zealand. So it has a, a huge impact on um, human uh, life, lives and uh, human health. Uh, and also has been shown through modeling studies to affect the, the energy budget um, of the Southern Hemisphere and actually have an effect on regional climate as well. So, um, so this question of global change started uh, really with thinking about stratospheric ozone, but has now kind of grown to encompass all aspects of change in the atmosphere. And so again, UKCA provides a great tool because of the, the way in which it couples to the UM, the way in which we can simulate changes in chemistry and aerosols together, we can then understand how uh, the, the atmosphere has changed and what role trace gases and aerosols have played in that. And then finally, uh, I think the, the most interesting uh, aspect uh, at the moment uh, is in modeling the whole Earth system. Um, now, when we think about the Earth system, um, we could think about um, it in terms of the interactions between natural processes such as vegetation, the land surface, uh, and human processes such as man-made emissions. Uh, so we can now use um, versions of UKCA which are in the UK Earth System model to understand all of these interactions and feedbacks. Uh, and again, I think what the, um, the most recent research is starting to show is that um, atmospheric composition, so the trace gases and aerosols, really play a key role in the Earth system, but that there are uncertainties. And so there's lots of uh, questions which are being, um, uh, um, I guess, um, discovered. Uh, and so there's a lot of room for, for new studies to, to answer these questions. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the different use cases, um, and I know that we, we have um, uh, a number of people here in the um, uh, training course who are experts in air quality forecasting and uh, experts in the AQM model, so um, apologies if I've got some of this information wrong, but effectively um, the AQM project, which is led by the Met Office, um, uses UKCA in the AQM uh, configuration or model to simulate um, air quality across this um, domain here of uh, the UK and parts of Northwestern um, Europe. Uh, to simulate air quality, we need to think about what's the um, appropriate chemistry. So, um, Obviously, one of the challenges that you have with using UKCA is the expense of, of running the model. And uh, on the one hand, you want to include as many pro chemical processes or physical processes uh, as, as, you, as you kind of think are um, important. But on the other hand, you want to be able to run your model simulations, do your analysis and, and write up papers or, or theses um, within a, a set amount of time. So there are trade-offs between um, complexity uh, and uh, resolution. And if we think about climate applications as well, the need for ensemble members. Um, so in order to address some of the, the, com the complexity questions, um, you, uh, AQUM uses a regional air quality chemical mechanism. Um, and as you've been doing in the tutorials, you've been modifying the chemistry scheme. So you, you, you know how, um, easy it is or hopefully you'll, you'll get a sense of how easy it is to change the chemistry uh, and Scott Archer Nichols will talk about some of the the big well the biggest project in changing chemistry um, in developing a new chemical mechanism but um, but yeah for, for modeling air quality we need a, a chemical scheme which is really focused on the problems of air quality so so that means focusing on things like NOx and ozone and particulate matter um, but we also have to uh, address the problem of scale and resolution. So uh, when AQUM was developed, it was developed to run at a, um, I would say at the time, a, a very high resolution, so 12 kilometers. Um, but now um, as computational power has increased, um, we're seeing simulations going down to um, uh, sort of four kilometers or, or even uh, lower 
or higher resolution, I should say. So, so in terms of those trade-offs, uh, I think that's an important thing to think about when it comes to your science. What's the appropriate resolution um, and what's the appropriate complexity? Um, one of the nice things that um, uh, um, the AQM team have, have done is develop statistical post-processing techniques. Um, and I, I'm not sure if Lucy is on the, the training course, but I think this is uh, work from Lucy's um, uh, atmospheric environment paper, which shows uh, the kind of the success of this statistical post-processing uh, technique. So, so why is this um, being used? Well, just like all models, um, when, we, when we run something like UKCA, there are biases. Now, for air quality forecasting, particularly for providing a forecast uh, for policymakers, uh, it's really important that the, the biases are um, minimized so that we can have accurate information uh, on you know, exactly what we think might happen in the next few days. And that's in particularly important you know, when we think about air pollution events where people may actually be told to stay indoors or, uh, or, or have other interventions um, uh, in place upon them to protect them. So in, in order to overcome this bias, and we can see the bias in this plot here, if we compare the raw model output in orange, so this is concentration on the, y, on the x axis for uh, PM 2.5 and ozone. Uh, and then we look at the observations in black, we see that, that effectively there's a, a shift. So the model is for ozone um, high biased, for PM 2.5 low biased, and the distribution is also um, too narrow. So we don't quite see the, the wide distribution in levels which are seen in the observations. So by using uh, this post-processing technique on a, a number of sites, so we have observations uh, across the, the UK uh, and also here in Ireland as well at Mace Head, uh, numbered here, we can use the information from these sites, so in green, to then generate bias corrections and test the bias corrections against the sites which aren't used in red and verify that this is, is working. Uh, and this does work. Uh, and, you know, if you look at um, uh, the, the national air quality forecast, you'll see data that's uh, coming out of uh, the AQM model. So I think that's a, that's a really great use case uh, and lots of interesting things, as I said, to, to look at in terms of air quality in the future as well. In terms of um, Aerosol modeling. So I mentioned that um, we can think about aerosols being simulated either online using coupled chemistry or, or offline using um, prescribed oxidant fields, which just get read in. The, as, you, as you're probably aware, the, the, the default aerosol scheme uh, that's um, used in all of the global atmosphere configurations of UKCA is GLOMAP mode. Uh, and this was originally developed at the University of Leeds uh, and provides us with an efficient way of calculating um, the aerosol distribution and, and life cycle in the atmosphere. It's expensive, so GLOMAP uh, mode itself it is, is, doesn't come for free. Um, and um, when we couple it with chemistry, that does make the, the whole model itself um, a fairly complex uh, and expensive model. So. In order to, to get around that complexity, we, we can switch off the chemistry and, and as I said, just read in these offline um, aerosol fields. However, the, the results aren't identical and, and the plot here shows the uh, zonal mean aerosol number concentration in these colors. On the left, using the full online scheme uh, and on the right, using the offline scheme using prescribed oxidants. You might say, though, that actually these look very similar, and, and if uh, you have poor eyesight like me, you, you probably can't really tell the difference between these plots. Um, but, um, but depending on your use case, you, you might actually find that uh, there's a bigger driver to actually use coupled uh, uh, aerosol uh, and uh, chemistry simulations. Uh, Jane Mulcahy uh, has uh, a aerosol evaluation paper, which uh, was published in GMD um, at the end of uh, last year. Uh, and that provides a really comprehensive overview of uh, GLOMAP mode, both in the um, 
offline only uh, sense used in the GC 3.1 um, model uh, and in the full interactive sense using uh, interactive chemistry in UK ESM1. Um, when we use it in the offline sense, um, uh, then uh, we have a, a limited set of uh, reactions uh, in the gas phase, which produce aerosols or aerosol precursors. And we have a, a, a limited uh, aqueous phase chemistry, which is really focused on uh, the generation of sulfate aerosol through oxidation via hydrogen peroxide and ozone. Um, GLOMAP itself, as I said, is a, is a modal aerosol scheme, uh, and these are the different uh, modes uh, and the different uh, geometric mean radii of the modes and the standard deviations. And this table then lists as well the species which contribute to these different modes. So you can see that in terms of the uh, soluble nucleation mode, this uh, comprises sulfate and organic material. And as we get larger, we tend to then go to include uh, uh, sea salt aerosol as well in the, uh, the accumulation and, and coarse mode. Um, and uh, when it comes to the Aitken insoluble mode, mode, we have then black carbon and organic uh, matter. Um, there's a huge evaluation and, and, you know, we could spend two hours going through uh, Jane's uh, paper, uh, I, I guess. Um, but just to, to, to highlight a couple of things. So, so one thing is um, here when we compare to historic measurements of sulfate across Europe as part of the European um, um, monitoring program, we see that UKCA in red uh, simulates levels of sulfate which are a bit lower uh, than observations, but it simulates levels of SO2 which are a bit higher than observations. This suggests that, uh, again, there's some interesting um, role for oxidation of, of sulfate, which the model isn't quite getting right. But in terms of the general trends, the model does a very good job at capturing those trends. Uh, partly that's probably a, a function of the, the emissions themselves um, having the right trends in that have been used in the model. But yeah, I, I would uh, kind of encourage you to, to look at Jane's uh, evaluation paper for, for more details on aerosol modeling. So then um, uh, thinking about global change and the Earth system, um, I, I think the, the, the kind of the, the thing to really shout about is the success of the, the use of UKCA in UK ESM1. Um, so this is, I think, been really identified through the, the way that UK ESM has really led, um, I would say, the world in the CMIP6 project. Um, CMIP6 uh, is kind of the, the, the major um, beauty pageant for uh, Earth system and climate models. But not only is it a, a way that we can understand whether our models are any good, it's a way that we can understand uh, the state of the science. And um, as part of this coupled model into comparison uh, project, there are a number of um, model uh, into comparison programs, um, such as uh, GeoMIP, AirChem MIP, uh, uh, HiRes MIP, which all have very specific questions they're trying to address. Uh, and again, a big shout out to Fiona O'Connor at the Met Office, who led the UK's contribution to the AirChem MIP project. Uh, and so the AirChem MIP uh, stands for Aerosol and Chemistry Model into Comparison Project. Uh, and so, as, as you can tell um, from the name, that really focuses on understanding how changes in aerosols and chemistry affect radiative forcing in the atmosphere and the changes in radiative forcing. So that, that to me is kind of uh, right in the, the wheelhouse of, of what we developed UKCA for and, and what we uh, want to use it to, to understand. Um, many of you as well might have been involved in AirChem MIP and CMIP6. And so again, I'd say just a huge congratulations to, to those of you who have involved in all of this. It's been an incredibly um, uh, hard job, I would say, um, but I think it's uh, been very rewarding. And, um, you know, just to, to kind of emphasize some of this, I think as a result of all of this hard work, there have been a huge number of papers you can see I quite like the EGU journals uh, or, or the UKCA community, certainly like the EGU journals. But this is really just a snapshot of some of those papers. Um, uh, a key paper that came out last year was also evaluating the, the chemistry scheme, which is in UK ESM1. 
uh, and is called the Strat-Trop chemistry scheme. I think it's basically this scheme which you've been using in the training course to, to modify and to add your Alice and Bob uh, tracers to. Again, this uh, paper you can see was a huge, uh, you know, collaborative effort between people in NCAS uh, and the Met Office, uh, as well as across the world. So um, uh, Australia, New Zealand and uh, all, all points in between. And so I just wanted uh, to go through some of what I picked out as being key things to, to, to think about and to, to talk about, because I think there is plenty of scope to, to again, to improve um, what, what we have in, in our model. So I'm going to focus on biases. And I think the first bias, which I'd like to discuss, is uh, surface ozone in the model. And this is work that Stephen Turnock led for this paper. Uh, and actually, Steve uh, has also led a, a paper comparing surface ozone to observations in all of the CMIP6 models. Uh, and what Steve has shown is that it, actually there seems to be a fairly significant bias in surface ozone across the CMIP6 models. Um, these data here are, are comparing on the right hand side, uh, Northern Hemisphere winter and Northern Hemisphere summer biases uh, between uh, the model and uh, the tropospheric ozone assessment report um, evaluation. And what we can see is that in the winter months, uh, the model tends to have a low bias. And in the summer months, the model tends to have a high bias. Um, these are really important if we kind of think about um, uh, exposure to ozone as being important for human health and vegetation. Um, I believe in, in India alone, um, enough crops to feed um, something like um, 9 million or many millions of people are destroyed every year because of high levels of ozone. So we want to control um, ozone in the troposphere and at the surface. But if we have models which have biases in them, we need to understand why those biases are there so that we can better understand uh, pathways that we can mitigate against these uh, ozone pollution events. Um, so the ozone concentration is kind of uh, a function of the um, rate of ozone production and the rate of ozone loss. Uh, and so Gerd Folberth at the Met Office also started to look into ozone deposition. And Gerd works a lot with the Jules community. Uh, so Jules kind of forms the, the land surface of the UK Earth System model and uh, is the kind of the interface between the surface and UKCA. Uh, and Gerd showed here um, the, the modelled um, ozone deposition um, fluxes in red and the observations in these grey dots. I hope you can see them. Uh, and effectively, you know, what we see is that there are biases uh, in the, the deposition flux, um, but that these biases don't seem to be incredibly systematic. Um, and uh, this sort of highlights some of the, the problems that we have with limited data sets. Um, and um, um, yeah, sparse observations. So we want to try and address some of these problems. And um, I think there's plenty of room to, to improve the deposition of gases uh, and aerosols in the model. Uh, this figure uh, came from Paul Griffiths, um, who works in our group in Cambridge uh, and uh, compares the zonal and annual mean levels of the hydroxyl radical to uh, data from um, previous model intercomparisons. Um, so that's the ACMIP multi-model mean. Um, previous model versions, uh, so that's comparing to the HADGEM2 ES model, and compared to a climatology of what we think OH might look like, um, which comes from a paper by um, a group at Harvard, which is possibly, I think, about 20 years old now. So um, there's a, a few question marks about exactly whether or not the, the numbers from this Bivakovsky paper are, um, are, are really... Um, state of the art anymore. But what I think um, really stands out is that the UKCA or UK ESM numbers, which are in uh, the large font in black with the error bars, um, highlight that in the um, uh, tropics, in the lower troposphere, we have a significant high bias in, in OH. And also in the um, northern, uh, sorry, in the southern tropics, in the upper troposphere, we also have a very um, high bias compared to um, previous model runs. 
but uh, actually a bit of a low bias compared to uh, this Spivakovsky climatology. So um, OH is incredibly important because it basically determines the oxidizing capacity of the troposphere and so the lifetime of gases which are, are emitted into the troposphere. So it's something which, you know, is, um, is produced through complex chemistry and uh, it's something which is incredibly difficult to, to just easily tune. Um, but that's not to say because it's difficult, we shouldn't focus on it. And, and again, I think there's plenty of opportunities to, to, to work in this area. Um, also got here the tropospheric, uh, sorry, the, the total column of ozone. Um, and what we can see on the left is the um, bias between satellite data um, and the UKSM model for the total um, ozone column. You can see that the bias in the tropics is the highest, about 40 Dobson units. Uh, and if we look on the right, this shows the bias in the tropospheric ozone column, which is around 10 to 15 Dobson units. And so that we can see that at least 50% of the bias in the total ozone column in the tropics is coming from the troposphere itself. Um, Maria Russo has pointed out that uh, a key aspect of this tropospheric bias comes from lightning knocks. And indeed, actually, people at um, CSIRO uh, and, and, and in other places have been investigating lightning knocks, and there are new lightning schemes to be used. And so I think there's lots of opportunity to try and address this tropospheric ozone um, uh, bias. And uh, also uh, some of the, the stratospheric ozone bias has been addressed by some modifications to, to the stratospheric chemistry that James Keeble and um, uh, a group of people from uh, Leeds and the Met Office and NIWA have been uh, working on. So I think, I think we're kind of addressing some of these uh, biases in the ozone column. Straptrop also um, tends to produce levels of NO2, which are much higher than observed over very polluted regions. And so this is work by Richard Pope at Leeds and Maria Russo, uh, and highlights that over these, um, you know, East Asian and Southern Asian regions, the uh, comparison against uh, satellite data shows that the, the model is very high biased. Um, and uh, Interestingly, over you know parts of the oceans, the, the model is quite low biased. And we can see that in particular that the model tends to have an over um, uh, over exaggerated seasonal cycle in the NO2 column in the um, uh, northern uh, mid latitudes uh, and in general tends to underestimate in the tropics and the uh, uh, southern mid latitudes. So again, understanding uh, the causes of this bias and, and ways to ameliorate it are really important, um, particularly given that NO2 is a very important air pollutant. So um, in terms of global air pollution exposure, that's uh, a good thing for us to uh, try and improve. <clears throat> Moving up uh, into the higher atmosphere, um, this is uh, some data that Olaf Morgenstern um, uh, plotted showing the comparison between the water vapor in the model and uh, data from uh, a, a satellite called ACE. Um, and what we can see is that the bias is plotted in this second row. So we have low water vapor levels in blue, high water vapor uh, levels in red. So uh, in the lower stratosphere, we tend to have um, a wet bias, too much water vapor. Um, and then in the upper stratosphere, we tend to have uh, a low bias, too little water vapour. Um, part of this has been addressed, again, in this stratospheric chemistry working group that um, James Keeble has been leading. And um, uh, um, I think uh, one of the, the key um, issues here is actually what we do at the top of the model. So as you might know, the model top is it about 84 kilometres. Uh, and um, there are many different options for what you might do at the top uh, of the model. You might overwrite chemical fields, you might um, just um, conserve them and um, 
there are many options for what you do, and they do have an impact on uh, the, the species in the uh, upper stratosphere and, and lower mesosphere. And uh, this is kind of starting to be resolved now, as I said, in, uh, by the work in this, uh, this group. Um, some focus now on some, uh, I think, important new developments. Um, and so again, um, with that connection to uh, the, um, the Jules community, uh, Good Fulberth uh, and colleagues at the Met Office have, have led the development of an interactive methane emissions uh, version of, of UKCA. Uh, and so this is kind of really quite unique as uh, it allows UKCA to act as the only Earth system model uh, using interactive methane emissions. Usually what happens for something that's long lived like methane is that we prescribe the level of methane at the surface uh, and read it in with an, with an input file that says at different times what the surface level of methane or, or other fields should be. And then the model just forces the methane um, mixing ratio to, to be constrained by that uh, input list. <clears throat> so what that would make is a, is a uniform distribution of methane at the surface. However, by having um, actual fluxes, actual emissions of methane, you can now see that we get a non-uniform distribution of methane, which is much more like uh, reality. And you can see this chemical equator as well. So you can see the largest methane emission sources are in the northern hemisphere, the sinks are in the tropics, and so that leads to this, uh, uh, this chemical equator. Um, and now that we have this interactive methane uh, emissions um, set up, we can start to ask questions like what happens if methane emissions increase or decrease, uh, and uh, we can look at the important feedbacks that, that methane um, generates in the atmosphere. Again, you'll, you'll hear more about this from, from Scott, uh, I think, tomorrow. Um, and so Scott's led the development of the CRI chemistry scheme um, into uh, the UKCA. And the CRI chemistry scheme really is a, a huge um, improvement on the Strat-TROP chemistry scheme. Um, it more than doubles the um, number of reactions and species in the model uh, and um, provides traceability to um, what we would call gold standard chemical mechanisms, so traceability to the master chemical mechanism developed by NCAS. Um, so it provides us with a, a reference chemical scheme. Um, uh, now it is much more complex and so uh, it, it does uh, require more computation, but it's not as slow as, as we did it initially feared. And I think um, the benefits outweigh the, the costs personally. <laughs> Um, we've also done uh, a bit of work on developing the UKCA website, and so I'm sure you've, you've noticed this, that the, the website has um, uh, a nice new theme for it. But uh, much of the, the content around the, the fringes and, and away from the, the training is old, and you know, we really appreciate suggestions you have, so, so do pop me an email or, or, or Luke an email for, for any suggestions you have on how we can uh, improve this. And you've also been making a lot of use of Slack, and I think Slack is a, a great way of um, providing messages. And so there are also UKCA Slack channels, which you can, um, you know, be permanent members of and um, use that to, to ask questions um, in the future. And then just a, a couple of other sort of um, science cases. So um, obviously uh, it goes without saying that the effects of COVID have been devastating. Um, and um, I guess one of the areas where COVID hasn't had such a, a devastating impact is actually on the chemistry of the atmosphere, because as we were all forced uh, indoors and forced to stop flying and moving around, our emissions from transport significantly decreased. So that led to huge decreases in nitrogen dioxide emissions, um, which consequently um, led to mixed bag in terms of changes in ozone. Uh, and we have a, a, a paper led by James Weber. Uh, James, I believe, is, is helping some of you um, through the course, which, which really highlights um, some of this. And so we see here the large reductions in NO2 
And then the interesting interplay with ozone. And so what we see is that in much of uh, Europe, there's a decrease in, in, um, uh, in ozone, but actually in regions where um, uh, NOx emissions and, and NOx itself was destroying ozone directly, um, the reduction in those uh, NOx species allows ozone levels to increase. So uh, a mixed bag when it comes to ozone. Uh, and uh, some, some nice work um, led by Matthew Shin in this paper as well, looked at comparing uh, the model uh, data in these four different scenarios to satellite data. And, you know, we, we see that the model does a fairly good job. So um, I also like to just touch on some sort of future plans. And um, uh, there's, there's always um, many, many, many plans for what we'd like to do in the future. Um, we can basically break this down into different types of activities. And, and I think one of the most important future plans um, is being led by Luke uh, with um, Scott uh, working on this, uh, and that's to develop a standalone version of UKCA. Um, and I think that's really going to be a huge game changer. Um, what that will mean is that just the way that UKCA couples to um, uh, the, the dynamical model the UM at the moment and in the future the Elfric uh, model will, will, will be changed. As a, as a user, it, hopefully, uh, you won't notice, um, you won't notice much, but it'll also um, give you the benefit as a user of having a, a, a smaller code base to, to work with uh, and a more independent code base to develop uh, and also um, be able to, to run UKCA as a standalone model, so as a, as a single box so that would be, I think, um, very useful for, for future developments. Um, and uh, on the evaluation, so the model, as you can all imagine, can generate a huge amount of data. Um, uh, in fact, such a huge amount of data that probably you will spend most of your time analyzing the model output rather than running the model or developing schemes for the model. Um, and, and one key um, activity, again, which has recently been um, funded is the development of some flight track uh, code. So again, that's work led by Luke um, with Maria Russo working on that. Uh, and we hope that that will be sort of rolled out within the next um, uh, couple of years for, for wider use across the community. Um, I'll skip over that. Um, uh, I'll kind of just finish on a, a couple of things. So, so I've got a um, picture of uh, Richard Feynman here and uh, a quote from one of his, uh, I think, most well-known lectures. There's plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, and I use that as a sort of a, a way of getting us to think about what you'll do with UKCA. Um, uh, and basically, you know, now that you've, you've started to use UKCA, this is an, an invitation to enter what I think is a, is a relatively new field of science, atmospheric chemistry, aerosol, climate modeling. Um, and I just you know, want to reiterate, I think there is plenty of room um, in this for, for you to, to, to work in and to, to find some exciting um, new things to, to work on. New and exciting chemistry is being discovered all the time. Um, and as I said earlier, air pollution is increasingly seen as, as an important uh, global challenge. Um, climate change obviously is not going away. And um, one of the things that we need to work on are solutions to this problem, rather than just reiterating exactly how devastating it will be. And I think UKCA is a, is a fantastic tool uh, to enable you to go on in your career to try and identify solutions uh, and trade-offs uh, in this space. Um, and, and just to say, you know, I've given you a snapshot. I've, I don't know how long I've been talking for, um, 40 odd minutes. Um, there are many more major developments that I've not discussed. And there's a huge number of people uh, and a huge community here of people. Uh, and I want to just thank uh, all, everyone for, for all the work that, that they put into UKCA. And uh, I just finished with saying that we want you to enjoy UKCA. Uh, I think science is best when it's fun. Uh, and so hopefully UKCA puts the U into fun. <laughs>